Romans chapter 6, Romans 6 chapter. Probably the underlying foundation of the social outworking of the gospel of Jesus Christ other than reaching people for Christ. As Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. It says that a little bit of salt will leaven the entire loaf. Salt. And this idea of freedom that we're talking about today that I'm talking about, no longer slaves and freedom in Christ, this had a profound effect in culture. It's had a profound effect in American culture, European culture, all around the world. They were no longer slaves, the salt effect that it's had on culture. If you would stand with me, I'm going to read these first seven verses of Romans 6 and then we'll pray. Before we read these verses, I want to ask you a question. Um, how many of you here today want to be a slave? And I don't mean to Christ, okay? Not to Christ. I'm not talking about to Jesus. How many of you would like to be a... Your goal in life is to be enslaved by someone or something other than Christ. Nobody? Good. Yeah. We want to be free, amen? We want to be free people. Verse 1, Romans 6. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may multiply, may abound? I love the King James. God forbid. Homan says, absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. For if we've been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Since a person who has died is freed from sin's claims or from sin's power. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for your salvation through Christ that saves us from sin. It also saves us from the power of sin so that we don't have to be subservient to sin any longer. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> the gospel of Jesus Christ, of, cor of course, first and foremost has to do with our own personal salvation. As we know from Scripture, we all live with the um, kind of harsh reality that we are all by nature and by choice sinners. It kind of cuts against the grain of kind of popular politically correct thinking that wants to tell us that we are all by nature, that we're all to, in our ultimate being, we're good. You know, we're basically good. And one of the great challenges in life is to just bring out the good that's within us. Well, that's contrary to what the Bible teaches us because the Bible tells us, the Bible teaches us that in our basic human nature, apart from Christ in our human nature, that we are sinners by nature and by choice. 
Even talking about the very heart of man, the Bible tells us that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Amen? And we need to be saved from the sin. And that's why Jesus came and died on the cross. He paid the penalty. He was a substitute. As we saw last week, he was a propitiation for our sin. And we want to go today, take it a next fur, uh, the next step further. And as we experience salvation with the idea that we're the salt of the earth, that this reality, this freedom from the consequence of sin, the penalty of sin, again, the first and foremost, we have, that happens to us as an individual, but it also then has a way of working itself and to, out into our culture as well. It has, if you will, a social impact. From the, from the standpoint that we're a salt in the earth. <clears throat> I like to illustrate it like this on kind of the big scale. Um, we're currently, and, and I've, I've talked about this quite a bit in years past, I hadn't much lately. We're right now in the United States of America, we're in the middle of the third great awakening of American history. Amen, everybody excited about that? <laughs> Yay, we're in a great awakening. Now, if you read the paper and listen to the news, you might think, oh, these are difficult times, amen? Challenging times. So, Chuck, why do you say we're in the middle of the Third Great Awakening in American history? Well, uh, historians tell us the First Great Awakening, 1730 to 1750, colonial America, okay? The 13 original colonies out there, 1730. 1776 hadn't happened yet, you know, the whole Declaration of Independence and all that. So we're under British rule. We're under the British monarchy. 1730, 1750. We had British troops on our soil. And we had British naval forces on our coastline. Those British troops on the soil, they'd confiscate property, things like that, you know, at will. It, when they needed it, they took it. And then, oh my goodness sakes alive, the king levied a tax. A tax, T-A-X, on the colonial citizens. He was going to tax colonial citizens for stuff going on over in England. That was the end of it right there, okay? <clears throat> well, with all of that going on, the pulpits in, in colonial America caught on fire with a major dominant theme. And it wasn't scheduled by any one preacher group or anything. The pulpits in America caught on fire with the message, the theme of freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ. The social outworking of that message, the salt social outworking of that message is what we call the Revolutionary War. <clears throat> and those 13 colonies said, we will be free, we will no longer be slaves to England, the Revolutionary War. That was the first Great Awakening. <clears throat> Second Great Awakening. Um, 1850 to 1870, 1850 to 1870. Now this is historian, this isn't preacher talk, it's in your history book, 1850 to 1870. And again, the pulpits in America went ablaze, caught on fire with one dominant theme. Again, it wasn't planned by any one group, denomination, just the Spirit of God moved with the message of freedom in Christ. And as a salt filtered through the United States of America, America stood up and said, we will no longer own slaves. And the social outworking of that second great awakening we call the Civil War. I know there are some people that will say, you know, the, the Civil War wasn't really about slavery, it was about states' rights. <laughs> Always about the right of states to make laws that we could own slaves. It was about slavery. And the church of the Lord, the people of God in America, the salt worked in this culture and said, we won't own slaves. And it was a costly war. It was about freedom in Christ. It was about the dignity and worth of every human being. Amen. 
We're in the middle of our third great awakening. And you know what? It's going to be about, it's going to be about freedom again. Because the Bible, the Word of God tells us that <clears throat> the borrower is a servant to the lender. And whenever sociologists and those, you know, when people, when experts tell us, researchers tell us, for example, in, in the, de in the dis dissolving, the destruction of the family, the divorce rate in America, you hear all the numbers about divorce and all that kind of thing. And when they tell us, none, this is preacher talk, when sociologists and economists, when they tell us that 86%, 86% of all marriages that fail, the number one underlying cause is debt. The pressure, the problems associated with debt. It's destroying our families. <clears throat> God's going to work to set his people free. But it's hard waking up. How many of y'all really love to get awakened out of a good sleep? <laughs> yeah. yeah, anybody like to get shaken out of sleep? <clears throat> uh, Paul writes to the church and says, wake up, O sleeper. It's, it's aggravating to get awakened, amen? Uh, nobody really likes that. If you would have been in colonial America in 1748 with British troops on our soil, confiscating property and stuff at will, and if somebody, if somebody would have walked into the pulpit of your church and said, aren't y'all excited? We're in the middle of the first great awakening. <laughs> You'd have said, you are a fool. This is the worst of times. Amen? If you'd have been a member of First Baptist Church over in Atlanta, Georgia in 1863, Dr. Charles Stanley's pulpit, 1863, General Sherman garnering his troops on the outskirts, the border of Atlanta, getting ready for the tragic assault on Atlanta, Georgia, the devastating assault. And if you'd have stood in the pulpit of First Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and said, oh, we're in the Second Great Awakening, and aren't you all excited? You would have said, you are a fool. This is the worst of times. You see, when you're in the middle of an awakening, it feels like the worst of times. God has to shake the church to wake it up until the church finally stands up and says we will not be slaves we will be free freedom in Christ all right and that goes right back to the very foundation of sin itself we want to be free Romans chapter 8 look at Romans 8 all right that's the message now let me illustrate it with a couple of points. How many of you want to be slaves? How many of you want to be free people? Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure? Oh, in the first seven chapters of Romans, in the first seven chapters of Romans, uh, Paul goes to a lot of extent in those seven cha chapters to convince us of one thing, that we are guilty under the law, under the law of God, under the Old Testament law. We are guilty. We are all sinners. That's the whole first seven chapters in a nutshell. We are sinners. And then in the next to the last verse, chapter 7, <clears throat> verse number 25, uh, 24, he says, kind of in conclusion of that, that we are all sinners that were guilty under the law. He says in verse 24, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh to the law of sin. And then verse number one, chapter eight. Chapter eight is the turning point. After being convinced that I need to be delivered from the power of sin, then it starts. That truth begins in chapter 8 through the rest of, the, of Romans. Verse number 1. Therefore, no condemnation, no condemnation, zero, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. Because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, that doesn't give us permission to go out and sin boldly. Amen. 
as some would say. Some would even say, we saw this last week in the lesson on Sunday morning about some, some took it as a point that said, basically, we need to go sit in boldly so that more of God's grace can be poured out. <laughs> Don't you love the way the mind, perverted mind of man thinks? That was what's going on. We're free from condemnation when we're not under the law, but we are under the blood of Jesus Christ. The only thing the law could do, the only intended thing of the law to do was to convince us we needed a savior, was to convince us we could not save ourselves, amen? Under the law, we're guilty. We could never do enough. We could never do enough ritual, yada, 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 to save ourselves, to cleanse ourselves, to purify ourselves, to pay for the horrid consequent of sin in and of ourselves. We didn't have the ability and God gave humanity about 1,500 years of the law to convince us we could not do it. And that set the stage up for Jesus Christ. And under Christ we're free from the condemnation of the law and we live under the grace of God and filled with the spirit of Almighty God. Amen. Now I want to do a little exercise with you this morning. I did this in 830 service and no one passed out. I want to, I want to kind of bring it home kind of a... Um, a, a, a real personal kind of application thing. Back in the 70s, there was a movie. I didn't see the movie, but it was a popular movie in the 70s. Some of y'all might have seen it called Love Story. Anybody see that movie in the set, Love Story? Did y'all like it? I'm not going to knock it. I, I didn't see it. And I think there was a phrase that came out of that. You can correct me if I'm wrong. There was a phrase in Love Story that I heard quoted, bantered around quite a bit that went like this, love is never having to say you're sorry. Didn't that come out of love? Love is never having to say you're sorry. It was kind of a sympathetic, you know, thing. Love's never having to say you're sorry. You know that. How many of y'all ever been married? <laughs> now we say we're in love, right? How many of you have ever been married and had that philosophy? Well, I ain't going to say I'm sorry. <laughs> or the idea of the love story, if you really love somebody, you'd never do anything you need to say you were sorry for. Right? Some, something along that. I want to I wanna put a new twist on this thing about I'm sorry, and I want to encourage you in your relationships to never say that again. Never say I'm sorry. Do I have your attention? Husbands, wives... Never say I'm sorry to your spouse again. And I, I'm going to tell you why. To say I'm sorry, you know what it is? It's kind of like there's another, there's a little kind of adjective, adverbial thing that goes with it. And it's a little three letter word, B-U-T. It, sometimes it's implied and sometimes it's overtly stated. I'm sorry but if you wouldn't have done such and such, I wouldn't have screamed in your face. Oh, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry almost gives us permission to blame the other person for what I did. You see what I'm saying? It's got the, is but a adverb, adjective, what is it? Somebody, I'm sorry, but. So I want, to, I don't want us to say I'm sorry anymore in our relationships. I want to give you the, more biblical response that doesn't have a but added on to it. Okay, and it's three words. And it's three of the most difficult words for a human being to say to another human or a group. Are you ready? I was wrong. Ain't no but in that, is there? I was wrong. And then if you want to add three more, please forgive me. I was wrong. There's a whole different reality in that than, oh, I'm sorry. How many of y'all had a parent? <clears throat> well, we all had parents. How many of y'all, when you were a kid, ever had a parent that made you, forced you to go to someone and say, I'm sorry? 
Maybe a brother or sister. <laughs> and if you did, if your parent made you do that, or if you're a parent that has made your child do that, you're going to go tell him you're sorry. Amen? Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You all know you're, la you're laughing because you're relating. Amen? I'm sorry. You can make me say it, but it ain't the way I feel. Amen? It's a whole different thing to say, I was wrong. I was wrong. You know what? There's a freedom in that, though. There's a freedom in that. It's freedom. Whenever you get to the place where you can actually acknowledge, I was, okay, here's the deal. Everybody get a partner. <laughs> Everybody get a partner. I'm not kidding. Everybody get a partner because I'm going to make you. I mean, I'm going to have you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you <laughs> not to say I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> Some of you may not have ever said these three words in your life. I'm serious. Some of you may not have ever said this in your life. And I just want you to see what it feels like, okay? Get a partner. Everybody get a partner. Rick, Lisa, get a partner. Come on up here, babies. You get by Seth. You got a, we got a young lady sitting by herself. Y'all get her up here. Come here. Yeah, you. <laughs> okay, you go help her, Mary. Right. <laughs> Pam, who are you with? <laughs> okay good there we go you got a partner there Seth okay <clears throat> look at your partner look them in the eye don't look at their feet look them in the eye and just very simply look them in the eye and just say I was wrong All right, we've had three people slap each other. <laughs> How did that feel, huh? Is that all right? I was wrong. <laughs> I want to tell you what, there's a freedom in that. There's, you don't have to defend yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, but none of that stuff. I was wrong. Do you know what? There's no condemnation in that. No condemnation in that. Would you please forgive me? I was wrong. See, that, that tears down barriers right there. That tears down walls of defense. There's no defense in that. I was wrong. Please forgive me. You know what? That's where real relationship is born. Okay. A little practical application. Uh, chapter 8, verse 12. Romans 8, 12. Free from sin's power. Free from the power of sin's temptation. Verse 12, Romans 8, 12. So then, brothers, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will die. Live all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. Verse 13, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Free from the power of sin. Temp How many of y'all enjoy temptation, being tempted? You know, there's a... There, been kind of a small rash of movies, books, ideas about heaven, you know, how great heaven is for real. One about a boy that had a supposed heavenly experience. I don't know, I'm not judging, but that, that kind of thing. And when you think about heaven, you know, we, can have, we do have, and God gives us a lot of grandiose thoughts, you know, the beauty, the glory of heaven, being in the presence of God, seeing Jesus face to face. Uh, John writes in 1 John 3, 2 and says, Brothers, we don't yet know what we'll be, but we know that when we see him, we will be as he is. 
We see in the book of Revelation, there's a new heaven and a new earth. The former things have passed away. Behold, all things have become. We get, we get some really powerful pictures of, of the glory of heaven, the joy of heaven. <clears throat> but you know, when I think about heaven, I want to tell you the one thing when I think about heaven that I'm looking forward to as much as anything just as an individual along with the other great, you know, presence of God things, I'm looking forward to not having to deal with temptation ever again. No temptation. Can you imagine what that would be like to never be tempted again? Um, that's going to be heavenly. I'm looking forward to that. And Paul writes and says, even in this life, with certain kind, with things, if we die to self, we can be free from temptation. I know, <clears throat> I've shared with y'all before, so it's no earth-shattering thing, you know. I, I spent a couple of years of my life as a diehard alcoholic, a snot slobber and drunk, okay? Now, I'm not talking about alcohol, right, wrong. I want, you know, when the Bible talks about a wine in the New Testament, it was wine, okay? It wasn't grape juice, all right? What the Bible condemns is the abuse of, okay? But I was an alcoholic, and that's not good. That was sin. I know I, I, I never did really understand it, even though I knew I was a snot locker drunk. Y'all do know what a snot locker drunk is, don't you? It was, I, was, I was back home, I was back in Fort Smith, it's 1973, the fall of 73. I'd been back home uh, for about two or three months. And I really thought when I got out of the service and went back home, I'd get back with the old buddies, get back in my old church, and you know, and everything would kind of be like it was in 1969 before I left. <laughs> you know, I really kind of expected that. I, not in so many words, but I just in my mind, I thought, man, I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to going back home, you know. Amen? Ever been there? Looking forward to going back home. And so I'd been back home, and I was enrolled in college there at West Art Community College in Fort Smith, and um, I, got, I go to pick up something at the grocery store, and all of a sudden I realize, it's like I wake up, and I'm, I'm standing at the cooler section looking at the beer, and it's like I was hypnotized. I was just, it's like I woke up and thought, what am I doing, <laughs> you know? And I went to my pastor, my dear pastor there in Fort Smith, Brother Don Moore, and, and I finally figured out I, I had a problem. I figured out I had a problem. And so I go to Brother Don, I tell him what my problem is, I tell him openly, and the guy, he puts me to work in the church. He gives me a group of 10th grade boys, a Sunday school class, had about 15 10th grade boys, puts me to work over in Moffat, Oklahoma, with me telling him my problems. What kind of a preacher does that? And I came in, it, was, it didn't take long, two, three, four weeks, something like that. I come in on Sunday morning, I've got a horrible hangover, and I'm sitting down with my 12, 15, 10th grade boys looking at them, and I can't even hardly talk, can't think, and I probably smell like a brewery. And it made me sick to my stomach at what I'd become. And I told my, my young men, I said, I got, I'm sick, I gotta go. And I go back to the trailer house where Danny Burton, another guy I've been in service with, we'd lived together. And that evening, I'm sitting in the middle of the kitchen floor, you know, legs crossed. I'm not going to do it now because I couldn't get back up. Sitting, you know, sitting like that. In the middle of the kitchen floor with a half gallon of ripple red wine between my legs. How many of y'all ever got so desperate you were drinking ripple red wine? Amen? Don't sue me, ripple red. And I'm sitting there cross-legged in the kitchen floor with this half-gallon ripple red wine between my legs. That morning I had to tell my 15 10th grade young men I couldn't even teach them because I was so hungover, disgusted. And I, you know, I don't really know exactly what happened. I, I can't tell you exactly what happened. But all of a sudden in my gut... And laughter, it's like, a la I'm, I'm sitting there looking at this bottle of ripple red wine, and all of a sudden I just started laughing at it. And these words came out of my mouth. It's almost like involuntary. 
And I looked at that bottle and I said, I don't have to serve you. You don't own me. You might ever had anything like that happen to you? And I got up and I took that bottle of wine and poured it down the sink. <laughs> and I'm not an alcoholic anymore. It doesn't control me. It doesn't even tempt me anymore. And Mary says, praise God for that. Amen, Mary? No longer slaves to sin. You know where that comes from? Only one place. Jesus Christ. Only in Christ. Hallelujah. Last point, Hebrews 4.15. This is a big point. Y'all listen. Hebrews chapter 4. On our radio program this afternoon at 1 o'clock, Path Saves Partners Against Trafficking Humans, I get to share part of an interview with a, with a lady that I met here at this church, I don't know, about 20 years ago. I didn't meet her at church. I got a call uh, this point's called free from hurts and offenses. Free from hurts. And we don't have to be slaves to former hurts and offenses. It's the word there in verse 15, sympathy. sympathy. We don't have a high priest who doesn't understand. We have a high priest that has sympathy for us because he's been tested, tempted, if you will, in all ways as we are. That word sympathy, uh, the Greek word sympatheo, it doesn't, when we use the word sympathy, we kind of use it as, you know, well, I can have sympathy for what you're going through because I've been through similar, you know. Therefore, I kind of, I'm, I got sympathy. But the, the Greek word sympathy is much deeper, much more profound than because I've been through similar. When it speaks about Jesus, our high priest in verse 15 there, when it says he has sympathy for us, it means he in real time experiences our sorrows with us. Okay? Uh, we, can't, we, we don't have that ability. Jesus does. Jesus does right now. I really learned this lesson when I met Deborah. Uh, one of our ladies, Rhonda Tice, called me one night at the house about 10 o'clock and said, I've got a friend who needs to talk to you. I said, come on over. So she brought over. I'd never met this young lady before. She was 26 years old at the time. And she poured her life story out. A lot of you know the story, you've heard it, about how it, her story started as a three-year-old girl with a stepfather that started sexually molesting, abusing her. And from the time she was about five, he was selling her to other men. She finally ran away as a 12-year-old. Starting as a 14-year-old, she became a mainline heroin addict, and she was that up until the day I met her as a 26-year-old selling herself, being sold. She told her story. And then when she got through telling her story, she looked me in the eye. She said, Preacher, I have a question for you. I said, what's that, Deborah? I want to know how your God, your loving God, can let that happen to a three-year-old girl. Whew. I looked at her and I said, I, I don't know how to answer that. I, I, I don't have an answer. I said, all, all I can tell you is that in all of your hurts and all of your pain, that Jesus has been there with you and he suffered with you through every one. That's there in verse 15. Did you know that? And I'll never forget um, that soaked in on it for a second and Deborah and her eyes got real big and all of a sudden tears. And she said, do you mean to tell me that he loves me? Yeah, Deborah, he loves you. He has suffered with you. He died for you. It's about one o'clock in the morning by that time and she ran out our front door and almost did a swan dive in our front yard and just wept for like 20 minutes. God changed her life. 
she went on to camp, got a PhD in counseling, served in the Lark School District as a counselor for a time. We don't have to live as slaves to past hurts, to past offenses because of Christ Jesus, because he's carried them all. You know, we talk about Jesus dying for our sin. Let me tell you something else Jesus died for. Listen to this. Jesus has died for those sins that have been committed against us as well our hurts, our offenses, those things that would ensnare us, entrap us, make us victims of former things. Jesus died for those also. Does that make sense? We don't have to live as slaves to former offenses and pain. Let's bow for prayer. Jesus wants us free. He wants us free indeed. He wants us totally free. So brother and sister in Christ, if you're here today, if you're you're living with old stuff, you know, like wounds, offenses, if you have bitterness in your life, the the Lord doesn't want any of that in your life. If you're living with anything controlling you in your life other than Jesus Christ, you can be free. You don't want that. God doesn't want that. You can be free. He doesn't want us slaves to anything, amen? Amen. He doesn't want any sin controlling us in our life. We can be free. If you're here this morning without Christ, if you've never been born again, been saved, can't you sense the weight of guilt on your life, the weight, the burden of the sin in your life? He wants to lift that burden from you by believing in what Jesus did on the cross the shed blood of Christ so we can be free from guilt, free from that sin. He wants us free people. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus. We come through his shed blood. We thank you for the power of the cross that sets us free. We thank you for how the power of the cross works through our lives as salt with a burden and concern and compassion for those who are enslaved to sin, the power of sin, the consequence of sin. Thank you for sharing your heart with us for others. Lord, if there's anyone this morning here or listening on the internet that needs to be free, God, set them free for the glory of your name, for the glory of your Son. Set us free in Jesus' name. Let's stand. Jennifer, you lead us.
Speak.